Um, the title uh, uh, of the presentation, Experiences and Dreams, what I mean by that is I kind of wanted to give you guys an idea of what we've experienced with our own uh, OTS that, that we purchased two years ago, and then kind of show you the ideas and things that that's given us for the future and what we hope to uh, uh, accomplish. Um, actually, where we have the simulator, uh, where I'm currently stationed, is Coronado Generating Station. Um, we have two coal fire units. Uh, Recently, we've added a lot of environmental controls. We had a lot from the beginning, uh, electrostatic precips, full flow absorbers, uh, which were recently added, calcium bromide mercury control. Um, we added the Lonox burners recently and the SCR. Uh, all of these things, uh, adding the new equipment um, along with the controls that went along with them helped us to justify uh, our simulation itself. Um, this is kind of a picture of our simulator. It's kind of a mock-up of the control room. Um, you can see right there in the We've got our control screens here. These are uh, hard panel emulators in that uh, they try to emulate the actual push buttons and things that, that the guys interface with. Um, our, you know, a, a lot of discussion on uh, people always ask how we justified it. And for us it was a lot easier and we were really fortunate in that we were doing a controls migration project at the same time um, that we kind of lumped the simulator into that project. And it was a very small percentage of, of the actual uh, project budget. Uh, given that, with the age of workforce projections, uh, really kind of pushed us over the top and, and uh, made it a no-brainer uh, for the company. Um, what we did, we actually upgraded from Honeywell TDC 3000 to uh, IA85, which is a Foxboro product. Um, what you're seeing there is the actual difference in the graphics. And, and you know, it's amazing. Uh, you figure we have operators, uh, 93 we put in the Honeywell. Um, so the guys have been sitting there looking at that for almost 10 years. Uh, you would think, uh, uh, and then actually 15, uh, before we started thinking about this project. Um, this is kind of the difference in the look between Honeywell and the IA system. Um, and we tried our best, you can see, to try to match it up the best we could, but just that little bit of change in, in our project um, uh, actually created a situation where you got a, 30, a guy, a 30-year operator that knows the process is like the back of his hand. And I uh, sit there, run him through a simulation, and then he, and he just locks up, just like vapor lock, uh, in a simple situation that he deals with day in, day out. Um, it, it was really amazing. He just changed the look, changed the background color, and all of a sudden, uh, the guy, uh, it's like he's brand new, you know. <clears throat> so that kind of, kind of already talked about that. What we bought was a SimSIS core dynamic simulation. Um, we simulated, uh, uh, we modeled the plant in Dynesim. Uh, we simulated our controls in Epsom, and we have Triconics turbine controls on our GE turbines uh, that we emulated in Trisom. Um, this is kind of what we, what we um, discovered. It's a, it's a hidden benefit that we didn't really expect to see, uh, and we were really glad to see it. We found 62 control issues, uh, just actual hardcore logic issues, uh, during the project of actually building the simulation. This was after the factory acceptance test uh, for the controls checkout. Uh, 82 control issues with the new FGD controls, and that doesn't include graphics. Uh, the graphics development happened, in the, for the most part, on the simulation itself, um, and uh, they were pretty much a mess. So, um, uh, some other things that we did, and I hate to read these off the slide, but uh, kind of get the idea. I mean, with cybersecurity, it gives us basically a testing platform to uh, analyze different scenarios, look for different holes in the network. It's an actual uh, mock-up of a mesh network, of our actual control system network. Um, so we were able to see the holes, see the things. I mean, uh, anyone that has any experience with operations knows if there's a button, an operator will push it. And uh, if there's anywhere they can go in the system, uh, uh, they're going to go there and they're going to look because they're sitting there day in, day out. If it's a quiet night, you're kind of just monkeying around on the screens. Um, the alarm flood events themselves, uh, one of the big benefits we saw, um, you know, operators hate alarms, but they love them at the same time. But uh, uh, what we found, you know, a new control system coming in, and even our old one was pretty much uh, had a lot of nuisance alarms. Um, what you find when you're running through a, a full simulation of a process, uh, those alarms start rolling in, and, um, and essentially the alarms were probably more realistic than many of the other parts, uh, but uh, it kind of made us realize we could take action before that happened. Um, Provided first look at our turbine. Uh, we upgraded the turbine controls at the same time up to a new standard. Uh, gave us our first look at that, found some logic issues there. And we used it for a lot of configuration of new applications that have kind of helped us um, you know, address some issues that we've, that we've had. Um, and that, that leads us to, to what happened what was the, uh, uh, it was a happy day for me because I was on the project in the beginning when uh, the management started coming in and uh, 
once we realized uh, all the control logic errors, we realized we had the graphics, we built the applications to help, and uh, the general consensus was the thing paid for itself. And this was before we even started operator training, which was what it was intended for in the, in, at the whole time. Um, that, was, uh, that, that was a really nice feeling. Um, it's hard to quantify that. People always ask to quantify that because if you're looking at buying an OTS yourself for operator training or for engineering development, everybody wants hard dollars. I mean, anytime you're dealing with any kind of people that are holding onto the purse strings, they want hard dollars. They don't want these kind of wishy-washy, dreamy things that happened. But it becomes a problem of how do you quantify something that didn't happen. And we, we would like to think that those 62 control logic errors, that we would have caught them before we actually started the process. Or while we started the process, we would have found them before we, it led to major equipment uh, malfunctions. But, but I can tell you, you know, we did um, uh, just basic loopback models uh, for the control testing itself while we were going through the migration project. Um, those found most of the issues. The issues that we started finding on the simulation were um, the things that, that you don't see with a loopback model. Loopback model, things happen instantly. Uh, with, the, with the fidelity of a high fidelity simulation, you actually start seeing the delays that you see in a real process. You start seeing the pressures and temperatures and things changing, especially when you're dealing with new equipment. Um, it it um, starts, uh, uh, you start really seeing that benefit. Uh, but to quantify it is extremely difficult, so I can't help out there, I'm sorry. But, um, let's see. So we ran all the existing control operators through four days of training, uh, as well as their supervisors. Um, we tried to um, build it like teamwork like they do in an actual control room. They typically have one operator per unit. We have two units and a supervisor. Um, we, um, we ran them through, uh, kind of brushed off the rest of them, but kind of gave them a first look at the controls and plus let us know where we needed to work uh, as far as building the graphics and HMI to where they could understand it and get around where they need to get and take the actions that they needed to take. Uh, another, another, our, another claim to fame, we had no startup delays uh, due to operator error on this uh, project, which was, uh, uh, made us extremely happy. Talent crisis. And this is kind of what we're dealing with now, and I think everybody's dealing with this, and, and everybody I talk to, and no matter which industry you're in, if you're in power, if you're in gas, if you're in, um, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, uh, we're dealing with uh, baby boomers are, are getting up and leaving. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of you guys in this room, and... Uh, um, how do you pass on that knowledge? You know, how do you pass on uh, years of experience and uh, innovation to a new generation that's coming up? Um, uh, you know, it's extremely difficult in, in general. And you know, we for years and years we ran classrooms and we we lecture them and we give them reference books. But uh, how do you really make them internalize that? And how do you immerse them in the training to where they take it seriously? So I always considered myself in the simulator kind of a bridge between uh, generations. Uh, I'm kind of right in between there in age and. Uh, Kind of get along with with both generations, so I have to uh, try to try to manage that between. Um, so uh, one of the big things that we're continuing to do now, we're running our uh, uh, new trainees uh, in through a six-week uh, training program. Uh, we kind of rotate them in and out of there pretty quick. Uh, every week we bring back the supervisor that's on duty and make them sit with them for a day. Uh, it gives them a chance to pass on some of their little tips and tricks, uh, but also give them experience with the trainee themselves because they're going to have to work with them out there uh, and uh, it's good to see, uh, get feedback from them on how they feel the training's progressing. Um, plus allowing the supervisors to work on their skills. I mean you'll find, you know, you may go 20 years and only see one process upset of a particular variety, you know, in all that time, you know, and, and so it's nice to be able to relive that, to try different things and to see what the correct response would be and just practice it. Um, what we've seen in two years, half of our control room is, are now simulator trainees, which essentially, um, those were just from retirements, um, which is pretty scary. And it's pretty scary for us to think, uh, even with the simulation, even now, you know, you're looking back and you're like, oh my goodness, you know. Uh, so we're, we've got the benefit now that we have half of them are with experienced people and the other half. Uh, so we try to pair them up with an experienced person and, and a younger guy. Um, but that's about to change really quick. If you look at that graph there, these are uh, people that are eligible for retirement and in the time. So uh, within a year, we'll have um, over half of our workforce will be eligible for retirement. What that doesn't take into account is sickness and, and injury that, that can, we continue to see on a daily basis. Uh, before I came here, uh, two in the two, last two weeks, we've lost three of our control room operators to sickness and injury. Two of them are, will, will not be coming back. Um, the jobs themselves, you're sitting behind a console all the time. Uh, you know, we, we have to try to think about addressing that with 
I mean, we can't make them use the weight room or, or run them on a treadmill every day, you know. And, uh, we've joked about it, but, <laughs> you know, it's just not realistic. Uh, so some we didn't take into consideration. So we're looking at a complete turnover of our operations staff within five years. Um, and that kind of talks about that there. But um, within one year, uh, the new trainees will outnumber experienced operators, and that includes in our main control room operators. Um, so there we are. And, of course, we're seeing the same thing in maintenance. And that's kind of where we've been, uh, and this is kind of where we want to go. Uh, we're continually adding uh, model variables. Uh, the simulation is really object-oriented uh, based on uh, um, actual physics, uh, but uh, we continue to add it uh, from feedback from the operators, from the supervisors that we get. Uh, we, have a, a, we do, do a, a lot of the development ourselves, so um, we, we get that opportunity to continue to add the realism. Uh, one of the, the, the big things that, that we hope for and that we continue to add is increasing the physical realism. Um, you know, we're, I've been working for a while to provide an interface and props to, to train. What we have in our simulation room, we have the software, which uh, the modeling software, we have the control emulation software. We also have a trainer cabinet over in the corner that has a mock-up of all of our uh, DCS equipment. So what we're able to do is I can drive real I.O. through the simulation or independently uh, to a little process control rack that I built um, that's really simple, some few lights, buttons, but I try to include a little bit of everything. It's a work in progress, but uh, so we keep adding things onto it. Um, simulating entropy, that's my pet project. Uh, something I don't get paid for, I do it on my own. <laughs> but um, the, uh, it's kind of a trainer's dream. I'll talk more about that in a, in a minute. And then uh, adding a 3D interface, which we hope to do soon. Um, you know, most of our realism are happening in, in the model. I just kind of wanted to include that to kind of show you the look of, of what we're dealing with. It really has a, a P&ID look. It makes it pretty intuitive to go in there and add changes and um, uh, to actually tune it to try to increase the realism from the feedback that we're getting and from what we're seeing with process data. This is a picture of the actual I.O. interface. Uh, that's the cabinet there and the little uh, instrument rack that, that is being built as we speak. Um, and um, we're working on that. Uh, typically, what we've done so far, we've been using the, the instrument trainees to uh, build the cart itself, add the air, do the different things. Uh, it's really nice to be able to go up and, and put a faulty piece of equipment on it or go up and rip a wire off or cause an air leak or something and uh, make the guy sit there and, uh, and troubleshoot it. You know, we can't really do that in the real world. We're not going to go out there and, you know, fail thermocouples and fail valves and just so we can teach trainees uh, before the experienced guys leave. So it gives us a, a really good opportunity to do that with our maintenance folks as well. Um, I showed you those hard panel emulators. Uh, what we're adding now is actual hard panels themselves. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of what we see in there is, you know, I got a video, we got a video game generation coming in, you know, and I'm one of them, so I can tell you from experience. Um, you know, you, you, you go and you get so used to seeing things from a, a visual perspective, and, and all these guys are used to playing games and stuff like that. But so you take them in with no control experience into a simulation. The last thing we want to do is for them to treat our units like a video game. You know, we can't start over. There's no rewind. You know, you can't save and do this or rewind or go back or do whatever. You know, you only get one shot at this. So, um, so one thing I've seen uh, early on was that people were, you know, they would get to where they were treating it like a video game. So a big part of what I'm trying to do now is to just increase that physical realism to make them realize that, that no, well, okay, sure, this is a video game here, but <laughs> the real unit acts like this as well, and you need to take it seriously. So that's part of what we're doing there. So um, uh, one thing we can do, you know, I already have been scavenging parts for years. You know, people take parts off different things. Uh, adding vibration, adding sound. I have some tiny air actuated solenoids that I can make uh, uh, create sounds like ERVs lifting or different pieces of process equipment that, uh, that actually fail because they actually hear those things in the control room. And the whole thing for me has been, it's almost like psychological manipulation in a way. And it's a big part of my job and it's kind of funny. Uh, because uh, what I do typically when I'm training operators, you know, the simulation does the bulk of the work. Most of the time, I try to make them self-directed self and not to, you know, sit there and harp on them and tell them, you know, you have to do this, you have to do this, do this, do this. Uh, I'm trying to get them to memorize the processes and learn to take action on their own. Um, so a, a lot of that, what I get, you know, is I need ways to, when people aren't taking it as seriously as I'd like, uh, you know, you trip the unit on them, they're like, oh, it's a video game, whatever, we'll just start over and try again. So. So I basically scare the piss out of them. I, I mean, it, I, I can't put it any other way. I mean, that's what I do, you know. <clears throat> if, uh, 
if they start uh, drifting on me, I just make it harder and harder and, uh, and start uh, linking that in to, to psychologically make them realize that this is a real process. You know. um, simulating entropy, this is my real dream, and I think it'd be a dream of a lot of people. And what I mean by that, uh, I mean, you, you can kind of read there what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, uh, things, things change, and, and when you have a set model, uh, you know, things aren't changing unless you tell it to change. And, uh, you know, I mean, the software has a full suite of, of failure modes. You can make valves fail in any way you want. You can make motors, pumps, whatever fail. Um, but um, it's not the same as what we're experiencing on the real unit. So what we're doing now is we have an, a, an APC, a model-based um, optimization software that's coming in that has uh, neural aspects. But that's not so much a big part of it. It's more using actual video game technology um, to uh, drive uh, uh, more realistic simulations. What the model can do, as far as the model process control, is we're building models on the actual unit. At the same time, we're running the software in the simulation. We just barely started building these models, so I haven't got to test it yet. This is a dream again. But um, uh, the, the big dream there is to compare models from the simulation to models from the real world. Compare them and basically force model objects in the simulation itself to emulate what's happening on the real unit that we modeled. Um, that way, when you come back there, basically what you're experiencing are life conditions on the real unit, but not real. Um, so in that way, we're, we are simulating entropy. At the same time, we have an upper level hierarchy of uh, uh, what they would call in the video game world would be an AI director, which would be kind of sitting back looking at the higher level, looking at process conditions on the simulation itself, um, making decisions based on performance of basically how hard to make it and uh, how much you want it to fail and that sort of thing. Um, 3D interface, this is coming soon too. I'm actually still a student. I've been a student all my life. Probably always will be. But uh, uh, I've been working on learning 3D gaming engines. It's something we're adding. There are many products out there available to do this. Um, my big dream, uh, and what I've got some funding to do, uh, we have um, uh, building the 3D emulation. We already have the process model. So building the 3D simulation is, is a matter of tying 3D model objects to act process model objects that are in the uh, dynamic uh, high fidelity simulation. So uh, tying that in, I, I hope to take it one step further with uh, little devices I've been playing with on the side that are all part of my ultimate dream of uh, basically building a, uh, a room that for total immersion of field operators as well. Because, you know, training control room operators is one thing, but if the, you can train them as much as you want, you can, uh, we've, got, we've got our guys uh, to the point that by the time they come out of the simulation, they have an excellent uh, foundation uh, to build on. And, um, what, and we've seen, uh, we get, we get a lot of compliments from the older operators that these guys coming in are a lot better than they've seen in the past, uh, simply because they know the procedures, they have an idea of how to respond. And, uh, but I want to try to link that into the field operators as well. And uh, I figure we'll have the same deals with uh, immersion and uh, the fact that uh, they're basically playing a game uh, that we'll have. So uh, that's where I'm going to use the psychology to mess with them again with uh, actual physical uh, devices, feeling vibration, that sort of thing. That's really all I got. Um, we, um, there's kind of the benefits we're experienced. Uh, this is kind of where we're going, and uh, that's it. <laughs>